Hello, students. Welcome back to our final episode from Chapter 5. We looked at taxes earlier. Now we're going to talk about subsidies, which are basically negative taxes. So many parts of it are similar to taxes, but some are reversed. Now, while tax lowers overall surplus or total surplus, subsidies do the same. So what happens is that, well, let's look at a subsidy on supply first. A tax puts the wedge between what the consumer pays and what the producer receives. Well, the same is actually true for a subsidy. So it's a gap between what the consumer pays and what the producers receive. So in our graph here, here is demand. Our original supply curve is S0. That gave us a market price of P star. So now, when you subsidize supply, supply is going to shift out by the amount of the subsidy. It's just like earlier when you had a tax on supply, supply shifted back by the amount of the tax. So now as this wedge between old and new supply, the consumer is paying this amount, P, the producer is receiving P plus S, the price plus the subsidy. So some intuition for why does supply shift out by the amount of the subsidy. Here it is. So to produce this many units, originally the supplier had to get this much money. Now once you subsidize supply, they only have to get this amount of money over here because they get that amount of money plus the subsidy, so that brings us back to where we started. So you shift supply down by the amount of the subsidy, that's how you capture that effect. The supplier no longer relies upon price alone to get their money, they have the price plus the subsidy, so that's how it works out. Now we saw that a tax on producers harms consumers. Well, in a similar manner, a subsidy on producers is also going to affect consumers. Consumers benefit from a subsidy on producers. Even though the government is paying the firms, it's not paying the consumers, consumers benefit from prices going down. Originally, prices were P star out here. That was the market price when there is no subsidy. When supply shifts out because of the subsidy, that drives prices down to price P. Consumers are happy about things getting cheaper, so they capture some of the benefit that was supposed to go to the suppliers. Again, the government might say, you pay us tax or you get this subsidy, what the effect is going to be in real terms could actually be different. A subsidy that's supposed to go to producers is partly going to go to consumers. Likewise, if you subsidize consumers, at least part of that benefit is going to go to the producers. We saw that taxes create inefficiency. They create this deadweight loss. That's because there are some trades that would have benefited both sides, both consumers and producers, but they don't take place because of the tax. Subsidies also create deadweight loss, though the mechanism is different. So here what happens is that trades end up occurring that should not have happened. Let's look at our picture here. So originally we had this supply curve S0 here that we had demand. We had this market price P star, market quantity Q star. Now for these extra units out here, it's actually inefficient to produce them. Consumers willingness to pay 
is given by our demand curve. That's down here. So I'm going to pay this much for those last couple of units. For the suppliers, their willingness to accept is given by their supply curve. That's up here. We will learn later on that in competitive markets, supply is coming from the marginal cost. So that's the marginal cost of making those last units. So the cost of making those last units is actually bigger than what consumers want to pay for them. So if we're paying, let's say, $10 to make goods that consumers only value at a price of $8. It's not worth it to spend ten dollars to make something that's only worth eight dollars. That's not a good use of society's scarce resources. So these transactions should not have happened. However, due to the subsidy, they end up happening anyways. Yeah, it's not a good idea to spend ten dollars to make something that's only worth eight dollars, but if I get a big enough subsidy for doing so, now it makes financial sense to me. If it costs me $10 to make it, and a consumer only pays me $8, but I get a $5 subsidy, now I'm getting $13 overall, 8 plus 5 is 13, and now I can more than cover my costs. So even though these transactions are not good for society overall, they end up happening because producers want to collect that government subsidy. So that's where the inefficiency arises. They're spending more to make those goods than consumers think they're worth. And that's this red deadweight loss triangle. So it comes from the gap between supply and demand, and it goes out into, until where you see the new supply curve meeting demand. So that's going to be a new quantity. New quantity is where a new supply meets demand. So this is the total amount of goods being produced. Actually, though, the story could be even worse than that. The government is paying the firms the subsidy, and those payments have to come from somewhere. It's a pretty good chance those payments came from taxes. Now, we already established that taxes lower society's welfare as well. Um, I should add a qualifier there. There are some kinds of taxes. We talk about this in my other course. There are some kinds of taxes that can avoid harming social welfare, but the large majority of taxes used in practice are not like that. The large majority of taxes do lower social welfare. So in practice, there's a very good chance that this subsidy was generated by taxing and lowering social welfare. So there's actually additional harm from a subsidy. With a tax, at least you put the revenue that was hopefully going towards some good cause, like schools and roads and bridges. With a subsidy, you're actually taking money away from that stuff and harming the rest of the private economy in order to create inefficiency in another market. There are some special cases, we'll talk about this in a future chapter, where a subsidy can be justified, but um, there are some significant hurdles to overcome before a, a subsidy can be a good idea for society. You could also subsidize demand. That would look like this over here. So D0 is the original demand curve. S is supply, so the market price is P star. Market quantity is Q star. So once you subsidize consumers, that's going to cause demand to shift out by the amount of the subsidy. That brings us out here to demand curve D1. With this new higher price P, I get this higher quantity out here. So just like we saw earlier, a subsidy on producers benefits consumers because prices go down. Likewise, a subsidy on consumers benefits 
producers because it drives prices up. Consumers are now more willing to buy because they get not just the good, but they also get the subsidy. So they want to make some extra purchases in order to capture that subsidy. So consumers start buying more. When consumers buy more, it drives up prices. Producers are happy about higher prices, so they capture at least some of the benefits of the subsidy. So in our graph, we get this new price P over here compared to our market price of P star. That creates debt weight loss for the same reason that we saw earlier. These extra transactions here should not be occurring. The supply curve, which is the firm's willingness to accept in their marginal cost, is down over here. What consumers actually value the good at is given by a demand curve, which is lower than that. So consumers are willing to pay, let's say, $9 for a good that costs the firm $11 to make. So the firm is spending $11 to create only $9 of value. Not a good idea. However, if it's a big enough subsidy, if consumers are getting subsidized by, say, $10 per unit, now it's worthwhile. They're buying it not because they value the good really high, but they're buying it because they want to get that subsidy. So these inefficient transactions end up occurring because consumers want to get that subsidy. That creates inefficiency and debt weight loss. Once again, there could be additional harm because the money to fund the subsidy probably came from taxes that harmed other markets. So who receives most of the benefits of a subsidy? We talked earlier about um, how elasticity and taxes are related. Subsidies are just negative taxes. We saw earlier that the less elastic side bears most of the tax burden. Because subsidies are negative taxes, that means that the less elastic side is going to disproportionately benefit from the subsidy. And it's not going to matter if you subsidize demand or subsidize supply, the effects will be the same. Why is that? Well, we established earlier that a tax on demand and tax on supply do the exact same thing. A subsidy is just a negative tax. So instead of taxing at, say, $3 per unit, now it's effectively a tax of negative three. You're just putting, putting a different number in there. You're not changing any of the fundamentals. So a tax on supply and tax on demand had equivalent effects. The same is also true for subsidies. It doesn't matter if you subsidize supply or subsidize demand. So that wraps up our section on subsidies and wraps up Chapter 5. So be sure to tune in for our next episode in which we'll get started on Chapter 6. In the meantime, take care and stay safe out there.